Tina Coleman, the Extension Dairy and Livestock Agent for Fond du Lac County. So we're going to talk about the first 24 hours. Many of this may be things that you truly do, but it's the finer details that we want to focus on when it comes to managing that newborn calf. So when we're providing the healthiest start for our newborn calf, there's four critical areas I wanted to talk briefly today with you, and that's calving management when she comes to life in our bedded pack areas or our pens that we are having the cow calve in. Colostrum management and passive transfer, which is key to her immune function and getting her the proper nutrients to have a successful start cleaning and sanitation, and then navel care. All of these happen within the first 24 hours of life to help success set her up for success as a calf and a dairy replacement in your herd. So first we're going to talk about calving management. And a couple of key things here when we talk about calving management is that this is really where we start to improve our calf survival after birth. Many farms, small, medium, and large, have practical calving protocols that they follow, that they follow understanding that when to intervene and assist the cow in calving, when to place her into a pen if you're birthing, on, on time birthing. Our maternity pen is huge in that we need to provide a clean, dry calving environment because this is the very first environment that our sterile calf will fall into or land in, if you want to call it that, when she comes to life. So again, this animal starts sterile in the womb, and then once she hits, once she's born, where she ends up a cat being calved at is where she's actually the first time that she's going to have pathogens or organisms or any other type of things like that that she has to reach up throughout her environment. Intervene early during birth, and we do like to have the cow calve as much unassisted as possible, but we do know about 20% of all mature cows and 40% of heifers do need some assistance with calving. And these calvings can be because of a misposition of the calf, they're just straddling, we have a larger calf, uh, various reasons. But really to intervene early during the birthing process is to really understand the three stages of calving. Stage one, where she's starting to go into labor and be re restless. Stage two is where we actually have labor contractions and that the calf is being pushed through the birth canal and out to the vulva to be born. And then stage three is actually the expelling of the, of the placenta. And so we definitely need to know when we need to intervene with her because this really sets the stage of how viable our calf will be when she is born. And one of the things that has come out here in the recent past is the use of a calf vitality scoring. But when we talk about a difficult birth with a birth with a calf, you know, we talk about recording her calving or dystocia score so that we can manage and maintain that calf, knowing that she may have some risks because of the dystocia. But we also have to remember when there's a difficult birth that that calf is going through a lot of things, both physically and metabolically. Short term, there may be pain and fatigue. Remember, we're squeezing this 100 pound calf through a small area of pelvic bones to get her out into the real world. And in some cases that we may have injury to her vertebrae or rib fractures because we're trying to pass a large animal through a small area. So for women, think about a bracelet that you slip on and off your wrist. Some days you got, I have bracelets I really, really love to wear, but they're just a smidge small. And we're trying to squeeze, trying to squeeze our hands through a small bracelet or a small opening. And we get caught maybe on our knuckles or where our thumb joint is. Think of that with your young calf. Going through the birth canal where the ribs and maybe the hooks and pins kind of get caught in the pelvic region and could cause possible fractures, especially for helping to assist calving, not using enough lubrication or for other various reasons. Also, some consequences of difficult birth include hypoxia or lack of oxygen. Once that calf is in the birth canal, there is the possibility of the umbilical cord, if not detached at that point, that gets pinched, which then reduces the amount of oxygen that the calf receives, because at this point, it's still provided by the mom. And then with the hypoxia, then, the calf will have respiratory acidosis, 
which then leads to the calf utilizing some of its brown fat adipose tissue, causing metabolic acidosis. And without that brown tissue, adipose tissue, she depletes that too soon. She uses that to help with her thermal regulation, especially on cold days during the winter that we've had or will have <laughs> or have had in the past, that that brown adipose tissue helps kind of retain that thermal regulation until we get a proper energy and nutrients into her. So all short term, you know, these play a consequence on the newborn calf, putting her at risk for many things, including her health. If we don't have a calf that is viable or have a lot of vigor to herself, she may have issues with taking enough colostrum, which means her immune system may not be functioning at, par, at the peak opportunity we want to. And then long term, there has been some research productivity wise. We don't get enough colostrum in her in the beginning. She's not suckling. There's other issues that are a consequence of difficult birth, which puts her back a little bit when it comes to wanting to eat, having vigor, and then average daily gain. So University of Guelph has developed a calf vigor vitality scorecard, and you probably have seen this more in the recent past in our media. There's not a lot of research here, but yet it's a great toolbar, just like Dr. Sheila McGurk's respiratory scorecard, in a way for our herds people, um, our farm managers and owners, to assess the viability of the young calf when she is born. And it's a very simple scorecard using the score of zero to three in 10 different categories. And those categories include the visual appearance of the calf, the initiation of her movement after birth, her general responsiveness to stimuli, oxygenation and rates, respiratory as well as heart rate. And this calf vigor vitality scorecard really goes after what was developed in the 1960s by Dr. Virginia Apgard. And if you're familiar with the Apgard scorecard, that is what they use with human neonates when they're born to determine the vitality and vigor of newborn newborns in the human world. So the vigor scorecard is very similar to the Apgard in that we're looking at key areas of the calf at the time of birth to determine how vigorous she will be. Uh, first, we want to look at the visual appearance on a score of zero to three, three being normal to zero being severe and looking at the staining of the myconium, which is the first stool. We don't want to see any staining of the myconium. And uh, what that means, if we do see that staining, whether it's slight around the tail or the, or the rectum, standing over the body or completely over the body, that means that calf has not had enough oxygen as it was coming through the birth canal. So part of that respiratory distress or respiratory acidosis allows the colon and rectum to contract or lose contraction and pushes that myconium or first stool out. And then that may cause issues with bacteria and contamination to that calf. So that's a sign that that calf has probably had some lack of oxygen being born through the birth canal. Swelling of the head and the tongue protrusion as well. I'm looking to see if there's any trauma to the head, tongue protrusion as in like swelling of the tongue. Again, a lot of that goes back to the lack of oxygen. The initiation of movement is when our calves are attempting to stand. So are they attempting to stand zero to half within the first half hour? Are they standing and walking? Or at least are they being sternal? Or are they making no efforts to rise in three hours? So we can use how vigorous that calf is, how the initiation of movement to really determine how vigorous that calf will be. Many times we've done this as general responsiveness with the straw test, tongue test. So using the straw to determine if that calf will shake its head uh, due to the stimuli of taking a piece of straw and kind of twirling in a sensitive part of their nostril. We're checking to see if they have a suckling reflex or even using the eye, touching the eye uh, to see if they're blinking or, res resist or re responding to the eye reflex. A tongue pinch also, um, whether the calf will respond to the tongue being pinched, whether it'll pull it back in, or whether it doesn't respond to that. Those are all key things that can be done to determine the vigor of the calf. The other areas include oxygenation, looking at the mucous membrane of the calf in the mouth. Is it bright pink, knowing that we got a lot of blood flow and oxygen going through that calf? Is it a light 
pink to bright red, or is it white or blue? And we're not getting a lot of oxygen within that calf. And then knowing the heart rate and respiration rates of the calves when they're born will help us determine too if they're getting enough oxygen. Normal for a calf should be about 80 to 100 beats per minute for a heart rate and about 24 to 36 uh, respiration rate per minute is what we're kind of striving for. So anything above that would be a, a score of one and then anything below that or excuse me if a fast heartbeat or a low fast respiration or low heartbeat would actually be a zero. So we can use these numbers can we do the respiratory scorecard and add these numbers for each of the 10 categories of anywhere from zero to three. And when we look at this, we want to aim for a score of 26 to 27. Uh, when we add the scores for the, for the nine categories that represent the visual appearance, the initiation of movement, responsiveness, the oxygenation, and the respiratory and heart rate. So 26 to 27 score is excellent. We have 23 to 25 that's very good. 21 to 22 is good. Anything less than 17, we're going to have issues with the calf and have to decide how can we help her be able to become more vigorous or maybe make some decisions or work with a veterinarian in regards to the, the calf. So calves with low vigor. So if we have a calf that has some low vigor, there's a couple of things that we could do to maybe help promote their vigor and make them more vigorous. Many of us use uh, large dry towels to help stimulate them themselves by rubbing them off vigorously and then hoping to stimulate their heart rate and their respiration rate. Also some research coming out about non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs. This is a prescription drug through a veterinary client-patient relationship. Um, an example of this is meloxicam. And if you think about a calf going through um, the birth canal and the trauma that goes through with that, you know, we do know a cow has a lot of trauma. We tend to her a lot, but even a calf can feel some of that trauma and become sore, flamed, swollen. And we can use uh, meloxicam to kind of help with some of those anti-inflammatories. And when we think about increasing vigor, what we want to first get to do is to increase that suckling reaction because we can get her to increase suckling. We get her to take in more milk, which then also not only helps with average daily gain, but helps with her immune system because we do feed the immune system. Remember, this calf is born pretty much as a sterile animal, one of the few mammals that really doesn't get antibodies through the navel or through the umbilical cord of the dam, we have to provide that through the colostrum or the first milk. So if we increase vigor, we can actually set many things in a process that we can help her, help that young calf be able to succeed in the future. Another way to increase vigor with not a lot of research, but Dr. Sue McGurk suggests caffeine. They've used caffeine in neonates, pre preterm neonates in the human medicine to help kind of stimulate them for their vigor. And we can use the same concept in calves. She recommends one can, which is about 100 to 200 milligrams of caffeine of a high energy drink, like five hour energy. And this is given orally and from anacetyl support, we've seen calves become more responsive, more alert 15 to 30 minutes after that consumption of that caffeine. So again, there's not a lot of, there's no research to support the caffeine, but knowing that uh, we use that in preterm humans uh, when they are born, and then Dr. Schumacher has seen this on many farms and a lot of some, you know, testimonies of stories, caffeine may be an opportunity to help do that as well. But when we have calves with low vigor, a large number born of low vigor, definitely work with your farm management team, your veterinarian, your nutritionist, your herds person to determine why you're having low vigor. And if you are, address those issues, as well as have a plan on how we can support those calves. So next on my talk is cluster management and transfer, and I'm going to kind of graze over this just a little bit because I know Minnie is going to be talking about this a little bit more in depth, especially when it comes to the nutrition side. But we do know colostrum is liquid gold, and this is what we give to the calves to give them that immune function before they develop their own antibodies. So liquid gold for the calves can't stress so much stress enough about colostrum management. If we do anything to the calf, it's definitely getting that colostrum with them very cleanly. 
as well as the amount they need, the quantity, and getting it into them quickly. And so we're going to talk just briefly about a couple of those topics when it comes to goals of our colostrum management. And one of them is really about harvesting that colostrum and providing it to the calf cleanly. So colostrum, it's a clean product until it comes out of the udder. And there are sources of bacteria that we can happen to get into the colostrum. Whether it's a milking system that's not very clean or, or the cow's udder when we're prepping her and harvesting that colostrum for her. There's opportunities for manure, organic matter, or bacteria to get into the colostrum, as well as a cow that has infection of mastitis. And then also something that we have a huge control over, which is our calf feeding equipment. All of these are sources of, of bacterial contamination and colostrum. And one of the things that Dr. Sheila McGurk suggests is that we don't feed bacterial soup feed clean, good quality colostrum to our calves. So when we think about quality of colostrum, there's really, you don't really know what the quality of the colostrum is until you actually test it. And there's two simple ways to test it. One is the clostrometer, which is on the right, which is seen on many farms. Basically, it's a hydrometer, which is a glass tube with mercury, and it floats based on the density of the colostrum uh, with the IgG levels. And this must be done at room temperature because if we do it when the colostrum is warm, fresh from the cow or cold, cool, straight from the refrigerator, we'll get some false meat readings of whether it's poor or good quality or fair quality. And so what it does is it floats in an area based on the amount of IgGs in the colostrum. And ideally, we'd like to have this in the green level. So very easy to read, very easy to use. The bad thing about this, it's glass. So it doesn't have a lot of longevity in a farm situation if we're not properly taking care of our clostrometer. And I also see many, many clostrometers that are just collecting dust on the shelves. So definitely, if you got one, use it. It's probably one of your best tools on the farm when it comes to managing calves. Now, newer technology is the BRICS refractometer. Many farms are adapting this technology. It's very easy. You can use the colostrum at any uh, temperature. And our goal is to have, when we read through the BRICS refractometer, that blue line, as we'll call it, we like to have it at 22% or greater. And that is reflective of a high, good quality colostrum. 20 to 21 is kind of fair colostrum, but anything that's 19.9 or less is poor quality colostrum. So uh, knowing what the colostrum quality, you have to test for it because if you just look at it just by the color or the thickness, that really doesn't tell you the quality of the colostrum. It's actually measuring the IgG levels of the colostrum to know what the quality is. And if we're testing for quality, what can we do with the information we know? So on this graph here, on the left side, I share that the BRICS refractometer, the readings, and the corresponding clostrometer reading, which means good, fair, or poor quality colostrum. So if we have a clostrometer of green or BRICS reading of 22% or more, we can feed a colostrum as is because it's good quality colostrum. It has 50 grams per liter of, of IgGs. Now, if we have 20 to 21.9% or yellow reading of the clostrometer, we have fair colostrum. And we can supplement this colostrum with a colostrum supplement product. Or we can use this colostrum to maybe use for the second or third feedings, but not for the first one. So if we're going to use a yellow fair quality colostrum for the first feeding, we want to use it for the, for the second feeding or supplement it with a colostrum supplement. And if we have poor quality colostrum, again, we can hold the colostrum. Poor quality, if I were you, I would just dump it. <laughs> There's no you need. And use a colostrum replacement product. So again, supplement is what it states as a supplement versus a replacement product. Replaces the total IgGs. The bad thing about colostrum replacement product is it's not specific to your farm. So it may not have some of the antibodies that your herd is used to seeing when it comes to pathogens on the farm. But again, I recommend if it's poor quality, don't use it. Fair quality, you can use it with caution and good quality. Definitely use it. And if you have extra good quality colostrum, definitely store it, freeze it with good practices because you want to be able to feed good quality colostrum 24-7, 
365 days a year. So factors affecting colostrum quality, uh, calves suckle before leaving or bacterial con uh, concentration. When we talk about the passive immune system, when the calf is transferring those IgGs through their small intestine, that portal, that system of large openings for the passing, those large proteins, actually begins closing when uh, they first ingest content, not when they first take colostrum, when they ingest anything. And the bacteria contamination concentration can also grab onto those large IgGs and interfere with the passive transfer from the small intestines into the bloodstream. So again, we really want to be mindful of those calves. Uh, we're not feeding enough IgGs or we're not giving it at the right time because that transfer system is starting to close up where we can't pass the IgGs anymore. We have delayed harvest or first milking volume. So when we have delayed harvest, that colostrum is already switching over to milk. First milking volume, our IgGs are getting diluted because the cow has to filter the IgGs from her own bloodstream into the colostrum so that we can get into the calf. She can only do so filter so much IgGs at a time. So the more milk that there is in the first milking, the more likely it's going to be diluted. I think the dry period, age of cow, the immune status of cow all have an impact on colostrum quality, leaking of milk as well because of potential bacteria con uh, contamination. And the time of year, heat stress plays a major role on colostrum quality on the cow. A quickly on passive transfer, you can see here from this diagram on the right so that the IgGs are large molecule, protein molecules that pass through the abomasum into the small intestine and absorb through the bloodstream. And in the middle one, it shows that over time, those that opening close, uh, starts to close, so less IgGs get through. And by 24 to 36 hours, no more IgGs pass. So we have that critical time. The more IgGs we can get in early, while those openings are still there, we can get that immune function started for that young calf. Uh, when we look at passive transfer, you know, we've got a lot of information, so we should be able to use that information. So Jason Lombard with uh, the USDA NOMS group, who does those NOMS dairy cattle surveys every couple of years, in 2020, use the data from the NOMS to kind of give us some levels of passive transfer that we can use. We used to say 5 or 5.5, uh, 5.6 grams per deciliter of total blood serum was good. But now looking at the NOMS data, if you look here on the excellent level of passive transfer, we're looking at 6.2 grams per deciliter or more to have excellent passive transfer. If you're going to measure the IgG level, it's 24 point grams per liter. And if you're going to use a BRICS refractometer to look at the blood for passive transfer, it's greater or equal to 9.4%. Um, and then those levels continue going down, good, fair, or poor, based on which type of level that you're looking at or measurement you want to use, all the way down to 5.1 grams per deciliter for total blood serum protein, meaning we've got some poor quality passive transfer. So we can use this information knowing um, the cat, this information to know if we need to beef up our colostrum management, our cow management, or you know what's causing that calf not to be able to absorb the IgGs. And when we look at the NOMS data, about 40% of all your calves should be in the excellent level. There are going to be some calves, 30%, that are going to be in the good level of passive transfer. I think let's focus on the less than 10% of calves that will be getting poor quality passive transfer. Knowing this information, you can keep a better eye on them and make more informed management decisions with those calves. Uh, reasons for passive transfer uh, quickly is not receive any colostrum due maybe to uh, poor protocols or miscommunication. They don't receive enough of the colostrum in amount. They don't absorb enough colostrum because they don't have enough. Or maybe the timing is not adequate or the colostrum quality was inadequate for the new calf. So reasons for fast, passive transfer are things that we can actually control um, improving that for our young calves. But there are some calves that for whatever reason biologically won't have good uh, passive transfer of immunity, but we still want to be aware of who they are so we can make informed management decisions.
Cleaning and sanitation, uh, just briefly, want to remind you that there's biofilms and bio, uh, biofilms are all uh, the feeding equipment that we have. And basically, it's a microbial growth on a solid surface. Think about your teeth when you don't brush your teeth for the, by the end of the day. You get a little film on them, and that's a biofilm. And basically, uh, that's bacteria, viruses, and protozoa that are feeding on the nutrients of carbohydrates and proteins, which is prominent in our milk feeding equipment. So think about when we're using the esophageal tubes or feeding that newborn calf that we want to reduce the bio biofilms and making sure we have a good cleaning process. The equipment cleaning protocol, this was developed by Dr. Don Socket from the Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory. This is uh, pretty much what is standard, what he recommends. One of the key things about cleaning is we're using the right disinfectant for the job, making sure that uh, regardless of what's on the farm, you need to use the right disinfectant, which means multiple disinfectants on the farm for what you're fighting for, and making sure any equipment that's touching the newborn calf is clean um, when we're managing her and processing her. You know, Mimi will talk more about the, uh, loom, the ATP meter on measuring how things are clean. I wanted to share with you here, Dr. Don Socket at last year at the European CAF conference in Berlin has put together, which people have always asked for, some guidelines or benchmarks when we're using the ATP meter. So this slide presents some of those. Uh, not a lot of research uh, given to this, but just remember that these values can change as we get more information about this. And the key is what you have is a, maybe what you consider clean on your farm. Use that as a benchmark. And as you further test using the ATP meter, use that as a comparison of how clean or dirty your feeding equipment and environment is for your calves. So finally here, uh, last few minutes, I just want to talk about navel care. Uh, sometimes we neglect navel care. And this is a huge part when it comes to giving a successful calf within the first 24 hours of life. And why do we care about the umbilical cord? Well, it serves as a pathway. So originally, when that calf is in utero, that umbilical cord served as a way for getting nutrients into her from the dam and then expelling waste, body waste, out of the calf um, and then filtered through the dam's bloodstream. But when we think about this, if that's happening in utero, once that calf is born, this umbilical stalk here is a gateway, a pathway for bacteria and pathogens to enter the calf and be able to situate itself in the liver or the kidneys where it can kind of hibernate there, if you want to use that word, and eventually be dispersed through the bloodstream to other parts of the body, including the joints, when we see a lot with navel infections. So again, why do we care about those umbilical cords? Well, really remember that calf is born with a naive immune system. She really doesn't have one in place until we get that colostrum in her and she starts building her own IgG. So really, we have a sterile animal and uh, we don't want to get pathogens into her or she needs to start fighting them off from day one. Navel infections can increase morbidity and mortalities in calves as well as reduce growth rate and eventually some umbilical hernias could be um, an outcome of umbilical cord infections. So preventing navel infections, have a clean, dry environment with fresh bedding. Again, that, that calf is coming out sterile. And when she hits the ground, she's exposed to a lot of different pathogens. So cleanliness is key in having a cow calving that newborn calf. Navel dipping at birth and 24 hours. 7% tincture iodine solution is the gold standard. However, I know it's difficult to get, so the next best thing is 4% chlorhexidine or any other umbilical cord dry out solutions. Again, we don't want it to be uh, tincture and iodine. It's a little bit of alcohol, which helps dry off the umbilical cord so it can start drying. The color of the iodine is great to know that you're actually getting good coverage. And we want to use a dip cup, and people have used Dixie cups and dispose of them after each use so that we have them clean because there's a lot of times our navel dipping cups get a little dirty with straw and shavings from time to time. So using a disposable type cup like a Dixie cup is great. Sprays get us coverage, but we're not guaranteed to get full coverage. So we recommend that using a cup to dip is key. And not only the umbilical cord, but also part of the stump where the umbilical cord actually connects to the body. 
Uh, monitor those navels, palpate that cord at three to five days of age. Within a couple of days, that umbilical cord should be shrinking down about the smaller than the width of your pinky. And then if your calf is sick, but not really, you know, feeling off, again, palpate your calf about under two weeks of age. Even though the umbilical cord's not swollen and looks like it's healing, if you palpate and see if it's soft or if she's tender to it, or if it's hard, there could be signs of infection related to umbilical cord. And then you want to talk to your veterinarian about the treatment when we're dealing with some of these navel infections. The sooner we can catch these navel infections and have good navel health, the better off that calf will be. So in the, quickly, we talked about calving management, colostrum management, passive transfer, cleanliness, and sanitation, and navel care. These are all key within the 20, first 24 hours of the calf life to really set her up for success. We have the environment to minimize the amount of pathogens with her and helping her have some vigor. We have cluster management and passive transfer to jumpstart that immune system for her so she can fight off disease. Cleaning and sanitation to reduce the risk of disease and navel care so that we can make sure that we close that navel up so it's not a pathway for pathogens and bacteria to enter her, which will then give maybe potentially some long, short and long-term health.